All right. Okay, we are live. Uh, uh -huh. Welcome Good. everybody to another episode of uh, Bitcoin Class. I'm uh, uh -huh. learning from uh, creator of Bitcoin, Dr. Craig Wright, and what uh, we can do on Bitcoin. And uh, uh -huh. my name is Xiaohua Liu. I'm a founder and creator of Esquip. So what are we going to learn today, doctor? All right, we're going to cover a couple of different areas and I'm going to start with a very basic one that's basic uh, in that it's built into Bitcoin. Uh, but mm -hmm. we, what we need to do is start uh, working out how we actually use this. So we're going to start with the concept of a stack machine. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bitcoin, of course, is built on a stack. So yes. it's got um, a stack and an alt stack. So the equivalent is either uh, a stack that we can save material on or a counter stack uh, is another way of looking at it. And uh, as we're going through, we can either use it as a, a counter or a full uh, alternative uh, stack and, and, um, and register type value to um, set operations and how we actually do some simple computations. So, um, if we're looking at things like simple compilers, uh, then we're going to want to be able to make um, stack machines to do simple uh, push, add, pop, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, to do our multiplications. And um, that will allow us then to have each sort of stage of a function, uh, not looping unless we unroll it, but mm -hmm. uh, doing the equivalent of a block of function when we hand the results to, an, to another transaction will enable us to chain each of these together. Alternatively, uh, if we have multiple stack machines, we could have them running horizontally in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, the course, UTXO yeah. model, mm -hmm. is this what you're yeah. referring here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and only one of them, of course, wins unless we've got multiple um, uh, UTXOs that we can use. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think a lot of people have been curious about this, but uh, even before we dive into the details mm -hmm. of this uh, stack machine. So, okay, so when you first design this, you probably have a choice to make, like design choice, maybe you write on some kind of like a stack machine or, or you write on some kind of like a, like a more traditional, like a register based machines. Uh, mm, the is, problem uh, then, uh, well, if you're going to be talking about a monetary system, how do you know when something's going to end? how do you know when something is final? That's the unique part of Bitcoin. Uh, okay. Everything that is put into a block is always guaranteed to be final. Okay. So that uh, pretty much says you have to use uh, mm -hmm. stack machines. Is that uh... Uh, not just stack machine, but the predicate nature. So oh, okay. um, if I don't know if anyone uh, like yourself or whatever, uh, uh, yourself or anyone else listening to this has uh, completed a predicate calculus or similar logic course. Uh, but Not myself. Do, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, we probably should go over some of that and I probably should do a simple mm -hmm. instruction later, but for the moment I won't. Uh, but I'll get you to start reading up on that and if you then think about truth tables and mm -hmm. alternatives, you can actually make very, very complex uh, pathways with very simple predicates. Okay. So, so predicate yeah. here, just you mean, uh, just a, to me, it's just a Boolean function, right? It's a Boolean variable. I uh, know it's a, just a function. It, it will end uh, true, false, function. or invalid. Invalid. Uh, okay. And I mean, you only care about ones that end true generally, unless they're in a branch where it won't come out. So whether it's false or invalid, you don't really care. Um, you care whether it's true. So if it's true, it can be evaluated. If it's false, it won't. And okay. um, that allows you to create uh, some very complex input output tables, uh, not just like we have with two of three or something like this uh, type uh, like rather than a two or three uh, multi-sig, you can now make very complex statements where if event A happens or event B happens or event C happens, mm -hmm. then 
that allows you to um, have, well, a single output that effectively comes through a binary tree syntax. So you could have many, many inputs, uh, many outputs and very complex structures that actually check very simply. Okay. Yeah, okay. Another like, uh, uh, kind of like go back to the, to the original mm -hmm. <laughs> design choice. So another mm -hmm. choice would be have, uh, when we, uh, it's uh, pretty much based on the language called force, right? Which mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. even yeah. to a lot of programmers, even for like people, mm -hmm. even in the interest of a long time, at least mm -hmm. for me, this is the first time I, I've never heard about it. I mean, mm -hmm. even for stack machine, right? You have a lot of other stack machine, mm -hmm. like a Java virtual machine, or even uh, mm -hmm. I think Botnet is also a stack machine. Mm -hmm. Why not just uh, based on and you some other program, more modern I mean, languages? Yeah, um, than Python allows you to do stacks. Mm -hmm. So you can do a stack in Python. Um, good for queue operations, uh, good for uh, working out graphs, uh, good for quite a number of different computations that you may have. So why is it uh, like uh, derived from force? Is it uh, uh, other than some other, even for other stack-based uh, languages? Uh, it's simple, it's fast, and uh, it, it actually replicates the type of language you get in predicate systems. So when you're talking about logic functions, uh, force is very close to a logic function. Uh, okay. the reverse Polish is used in logic. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about uh, predicate calculus, then the typical language will be reverse Polish. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got a background, I'm old. So when I was doing <laughs> computer science, uh, first back in the 80s, as scary as that okay. sounds, um, okay. predicate logic was actually a requirement not just discrete mathematics like people have now. Oh, really? You actually, okay. you actually had to, as part of computer science, you had to understand okay. logic. So when we're talking about the creation of uh, Boolean structures, uh, AND gates, NAND gates, uh, all these other different aspects of building a circuit, that would all be incorporated as well. So um, if we're doing something with a feedback, then uh, that could be done either by expanding uh, transactions out or by handing transaction to a new transaction. But if we're thinking about it as a single circuit rather than uh, with like clock cycles and going round, then effectively what we have is we can model the entire circuit for a clock cycle in a transaction or a part of a transaction. So when we're talking about payment channels, we can mm -hmm. then hand off each of these transaction components in order. So okay. when so the, the sequence number is kind of like, a, I don't know, is it coming from the cycle or is it? It can be, uh, yes. Yeah. So the uh, with what you've done so far, you've mm -hmm already started having output values mm -hmm. that you can feed into the next transaction. Yes. Yeah. Based on the transaction graph, we had uh, I don't mm -hmm. know, quite a few episodes before. So. Yeah. So uh, what you also did was looking at doing a masking function. Okay. So what you can now do is do a masking function against a particular set of transaction data. Okay, can you be like a little bit more concrete? Maybe some examples? Um, where you have data and where it needs to be uh, fit into the next transaction, um, which could be added as a push and then separated. Mm -hmm. um, anything that matches um, where uh, transaction data will go into the next input. Mm -hmm. um, will be uh, basically put in for uh, uh, as a, a zero and anything else a one and you match up the blocks of information where they're going to match the next transaction. 
Okay, I think okay. I'm, uh, I think I'm, I get a little bit of uh, what's happening here, but uh, still not a, like a concrete mm -hmm. example. Like, a, do you have a, so like a, a say when you, when we were looking at feeding into a particular transaction before, mm -hmm. so what we have done is take transaction A and only allow transaction B as a set output. Okay. That can be, for instance, a particular type of output address, a defined one. Are you talking about a little bit of a, the so-called output transaction to to constrain the place constraint on the output as well when you're spending, or is it it's more yes. general? Okay. So you could you can actually constrain output and spending. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So, um, very simple uh, address type thing would be. Um, based on on hashes in mm -hmm. um, the original version of addresses, so I can send to something equivalent to those. It has to match that function. Okay. Now the question to you is, why would it need to be that simple? We have a very simple address-based function. Address spaces function. You're not talking about um, the, the Bitcoin address? Like a the Bitcoin address as it is right now. <clears throat> so when we send to it, um, mm -hmm. when we're sending to an output address, um, the address isn't defined in the script itself. The address is an external function that is taken in part uh, by matching public key hash, etc. Uh, if we have matching hash values, then we're not going to be able to do anything funky and because our whole script will have to match. So where we have, for instance, um, matching the public key against the hash of that to verify it, mm -hmm. we can match everything, as I've said before. Okay. So all that data can be there. I see. So we can concatenate all of our data. Say we do it at an op push. Mm -hmm. We can validate that against a hash. Okay. Because the hash function will validate a large block of data. Okay. So yeah, I say think, we uh, have um, a 10 megabyte bunch of data. Okay. So you, okay. So is it all going to be in, uh, in the, inside the script itself? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we need to give the block of data. We need to give a set of instructions um, in our next function. And we need to make sure all of this works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can make a template match so that only that template is going to work. Okay. If we take some data out of our template and then we do a series of operations and we have something pushed back from the alt stack at the end we can evaluate whether all the steps have been done correctly okay yeah i think i have a one example would be i, I would think about the, the template always i think about the, mm. Almost like a, like a structure. Or, mm -hmm. So it's a structured data. So when you mm -hmm. push the data, it's probably like a just raw bytes. So usually mm -hmm. what I do is in a contract, I just uh, mm -hmm. first parse it, parse it mm -hmm. and then match different fields. And yeah. even, even I can have a different branches, right? Depending on what mm -hmm. you want. And then when you set up the, the logging script, you can probably, you can, you, because you can enforce any condition you have, maybe you can mm -hmm. enforce some. Uh, the the spender has to provide some kind of like a data mm -hmm. hashes to what do you predefined or or, yep. or some uh, circuit has to to mm. expose be, to spend this. Mm. So, as we're doing calculations, um, we can now check what is being calculated from our data and ensure that it's coming out to the same values that we expect. Okay. So imagine that we have multiple functions being calculated in our data that we're pushing to. 
What we want to mm -hmm. do is now create a verification script mm -hmm. that makes sure that the input information always comes out as expected. Yeah, yeah. That's always uh, how I see the lock locking script as well. Is mm -hmm. uh, just to verify mm -hmm. whatever that that's yep. fitting into, into the unlocking script. Mm -hmm. So is that uh, yeah. is this part of like uh, for now we uh, in the unlocking script we can only provide data. There's no opcode. Is this is uh, consistent oh, with the that's, original that's what design? I'm to say. Uh, it, uh, yes, but you can match it so that you have to have certain opcodes. What what do you mean? Not not in the unlocking script, right? Is it? Uh, no, you can force the creation of a script that goes to a particular next script. So script A, okay. yes. um, mm -hmm. it's not in the output script, but only script B that is predefined will accept this data. Okay, I see, okay. Which is what we're then doing. So we're, we're going to take our block of data that we can verify hasn't been changed and throughout the process, we can expect to utilize some of this in a subsequent script. Mm -hmm. So that if someone tries to not create the correct process, it's not going to end up validating. Yes, I think uh, I think a lot mm -hmm. of time this kind of a technique is uh, enabled by the so-called output transaction. So just mm -hmm. curious, so is this a uh, when you first design this uh, script system, is it uh, the push transaction? Is it part of that design? It's just uh, some, some, some. Yeah, it is. Sometime later, oh, I thought it was a uh, somebody uh, no. happened to to notice this track and then they even file a patent. Well, uh, no, no, um, uh, I probably wouldn't have patented this originally. Uh, I hadn't. Okay really thought through the process but <laughs> yeah. okay so <clears throat> so you, you are aware of this technique like a long long time before this guy even came up yeah. uh, kind of like resurface it okay yep That's good. all right so if we start thinking about uh, what we have um, pub key address function um, transaction functions etc um, then uh, think about some of the existing ones like um, simple scripts people have made for finding pre-images mm -hmm. hash, mm -hmm. hash puzzles etc now if you give the wrong uh, sort of uh, values then it's not going to work and mm -hmm. equally you can have something that must well uh, sort of end a certain way so if we then have a script that it's being paid to, so we, we create script A that pays to B, but okay. we set B so that it must be the same format as A or mm -hmm. some other format that uh, follows from it. And that is now going to be defined so that the input data, not just a single value like we've taken already, but right through the script can be checked. What do you mean by this? All right. So at the end of uh, A, we have A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. You mean the These outputs? Outputs. Oh, well, okay. no, just imagine that they're all um, in one block of output data that we need to feed into script B. Script B now uses string operations and separates each of these values out from the one block of A's output uh, number mm -hmm. into A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Okay. So what we've done so far is use the input information in A1. Mm -hmm. What we can also now do is save each of these other components that we've split out from the main block of, of data that we're pushing from transaction to transaction. Mm -hmm. And we can start filtering those into other parts of the transaction. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you can correct me. My understanding here is that uh, you, you kind of like a, uh, you know, original mm -hmm. login script. You you, uh, uh, you can place some constraints mm -hmm. such that uh, 
when the next one is spending you, it has to mm -hmm. provide all this uh, like a, in the raw data, for, uh, mm -hmm. just raw bytes, but all these bytes are actually can be, you know, translated to the further mm -hmm. constraint down the yeah. other outputs. So it's, you are mm -hmm. kind of like a propagating mm -hmm. down, almost like a, you have a deck at the root of the deck, but uh, mm. you can not only, not only you can confine the next one, mm -hmm. like a, your direct children, but also all your mm -hmm. descendants as well. Yeah. Um, so if we, we think about something as simple as a pay to public key hash, mm -hmm. then we're doing um, we need to match uh, uh, hash 160 public key op verify uh, equal equal verify sorry object mm -hmm. if we okay. don't do it correctly in order uh, it's not going to work right if we try and feed something else in there to make it uh, the same data it's not going to work mm -hmm. yes Think can be a much more complex mm -hmm. script. Mm -hmm. So what we want to start doing is thinking much more complex on our outputs. Okay, outputs. Now, remember also we can start doing checks as we're doing it. So, um, so that people can't uh, try and get around this by having a different output or depending on what they, I mean, our creation is, it may not be valid for them, but um, every now and again, we have uh, masking such as an XOR function against the data. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do a calculation, we check the value, uh, we make sure we everything's working out properly. properly random public mm -hmm. key or something like that okay <clears throat> all right so take your output and start splitting it into multiple parts of the input so mm -hmm. rather than thinking that we have a single output from transaction a what mm -hmm. we're going to do is concatenate all of our output and then on the other transaction we're going to undo all of that. So what we've concatenated in this one, we're now going to split back out into chunks. So what are the one potential application for this kind of a, like a, almost like a sophisticated uh, script usage you can think of? Um, it allows us to do more complex um, sort of calculations in script. So we can start building circuits that must feed into the next transaction. And uh, if, for instance, we have a defined transaction, uh, like a circuit, for instance, so um, it could be a, a quite large complex circuit, but only certain input data will now fit into it. Okay, so I you think all uh, of the functionality to be able to create circuits. Okay, so Sorry, uh, I, I think a transaction, mm -hmm. Bitcoin transaction and circuits mm -hmm. share a little bit of similar, similarity I can think of. For example, you have mm -hmm. both have inputs and outputs, but the circuit for each gate, mm -hmm. right, is just a, a one output. Is that like um, more fundamental reasons when you are, you think uh, these two maybe some way be, can be uh, you can have more than other? one output to a circuit. Oh, okay. You can have more than one output to a circuit. And so can Bitcoin transactions. Uh, so in the past, I've mentioned things like perceptrons. Mm -hmm. And you can model that the same way. So you can have multiple inputs, function, multiple outputs. All of these may not even fire at the same time. Okay. 
I think the difference I can see of a uh, uh, Bitcoin transaction inputs output mm -hmm. versus a uh, circuit is in a circuit is like a, each circuit you can think of as, as a is encoding a Boolean function, right? So you have the inputs, you have outputs. Mm -hmm. You give an inputs, you give mm -hmm. outputs. But Bitcoin transaction is a is it's not like the transaction itself is not like a function itself, is it? But it's kind of like a cross uh, transactions. Is it? Uh... Um, well. Start thinking of it as if you can create transactions that way. Start, okay. I mean, where you were saying it's not, it can be. Okay. So, so where does so, the function part? Is it, it just is the locking script, right? Yeah. Okay. But remember, we can um, hold certain transaction types that feed into a defined transaction type they need for instance a mask mm -hmm. so in the simple examples uh, the output data from transaction a can be an xor mask against the key address mm -hmm. yes now that means that you need to supply a certain set of data and mm -hmm um whatever key now that doesn't stop you from making other calculations that are also required yes i think it's uh, the once now we have uh, a neighbor re neighbor all the original of code is mm -hmm. yes, pretty <laughs> you can define yeah. any kind of a uh, computation you can have so i mean there are simple transactions such as five plus seven equals 12 and if you give the okay. answer 12 it would mm -hmm. unlock yeah but um, I could have the value input uh, that will act as a mask against uh, a key. So mm -hmm. um, it could be uh, one of many keys. And then that also uh, comes against the calculations. So now I have to provide the input uh, from the last transaction. Uh, that will unmask my key, allowing me to spend it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also need to put the outputs. And um, if I'm doing that, I could also uh, set it in certain ways so that um, I define how I want those other calculations done. Because rather than saying uh, 5 plus 7 equals 12, mm -hmm. I could take the uh, value A could have 5, and it could have seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. It, yeah, it's a, just a, to me. It's like a if uh, if condition. So you can yeah. maybe have it different ways to mm -hmm. unlock it. The same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once we start doing that, um, the other aspect is people think that you have a feed into a single transaction, but like if conditions it could call different outputs, different types of output. So where we have it feeding into transaction A to transaction B, as you've already done. Mm -hmm. yes. if now we can have an if condition. So it can be A goes to B or C or D or E. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, next, um, we can also have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So our transaction, uh, our function B uh, can have a defined set of um, not just one output, but many. Mm -hmm. Yes. And each of those outputs can be defined depending on the input. Mm. I think uh, we have created quite a size uh, many examples such as this, but one difficulty mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, I've been experiencing and some other people have been experiencing mm -hmm. is, so it, it, in each transaction, you can have multiple outputs, uh, inputs, mm -hmm. but the inputs is not, uh, so uh, some, sometimes people want to access uh, the other inputs from mm -hmm. uh, one of the inputs, but it seems that not that part is not uh, easy to do. You can access the previous out transaction uh, locking script, but somehow, because when you 
for example, you you have a transaction one, two, and then mm -hmm. they each have one output, and then you spending in you are in spending both of them in transaction three. But sometimes you want to uh, from uh, one of the inputs, you want to access the other. For example, from you have a uh, input one spending transaction one output, mm -hmm. input two spending transaction two's out, output. But somehow, mm -hmm. sometimes you want to see from a uh, transaction one input, the one is spending, you want to mm -hmm. see what, what the transaction two is doing. Is that something mm -hmm. uh, desirable, this scheme to have, or you, you, it's just uh, uh, not easy to- No, it's, it, the problem is, um, is not going to be easy. So you're correct there. Uh, when we're doing this, it's all very low level and it's even harder than it is in taking assembly language and linking all this. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why um, us making it will make it a lot easier for other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is your experience with um, stack machines at the moment? I think it's uh, because I've been working on the compiler for quite a while. I think I'm, I'm uh, not uh, as top notch as you, but I probably know some a little bit uh, things. I've been looking at uh, all kinds of mm -hmm. virtual machines because I've, mm -hmm. I want to design the, to learn from mm -hmm. the, the best of mm -hmm. all of them. And mm -hmm. uh, I think was, half of them I look at is a register based, half of them I look at the stack based. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, most. Well, let's say unfortunately, but most machines are stack based now. So uh, mm -hmm. are not stack based now, I should say, are, are register based. Yeah, just, and yes. um, uh, that sort of uh, skews how people think about computing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so mostly yeah. you start in memory, you load it, but, uh, mm -hmm. so putting in register. It's, it's a, the stack machine is a pretty like. A, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was uh, this two paradigm that competing like mm -hmm. almost like uh, 50 years ago and somehow it's uh, like a stack machine at, at least uh, for mm -hmm. physical machines almost died out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me get you a couple things that I can pop in the mm -hmm. chat here. Okay. Okay, so one thing I'm going to get you to look at first of all, if mm -hmm. you, this is a uh, this link I've just given you is okay. a tree proof generator. It's um, to do with um, logic functions in um, uh, predicate logic. Uh, mm -hmm. All of the functions here that we have uh, that, that are defined uh, within uh, Bitcoin, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the arrow is effectively an if statement. The mm -hmm. um, We've got or not, et cetera. Uh, so we can actually make semantic tables that um, uh, can now extend out and not only go into a, uh, a stack machine, but can have uh, different requirements based on keys or hashes, et cetera. Okay. Even if they're the key, uh, different values will end up having different potential output values. For instance, uh, where we're talking about um, uh, A and uh, like it could be a key, it could be a hash, it could be some other calculation that needs to be decided. Some of that could be done on chain, some could be done off chain. Mm -hmm. And in this process, now we can have um, not just like people talk about very simple uh, uh, sort of trees of addresses and, and other such things. Mm -hmm. The complexity could be incredibly large for very simple operations. Okay. So when we're doing logic calculations and uh, looking at propositional logic, which I'm giving you a few sites, I don't know why any of mm -hmm. them haven't updated out of the 90s, but mm -hmm. welcome to logic. Okay. Um, this allows us to create complex models. So um, very quickly we can get, um, I mean, if you want to have large arrays of potential numbers, 
uh, for instance, uh, if you want a group of a hundred people who all have have keys, and you want to be able to set uh, three of these people, eight of these people, all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. all of that can be done. Yeah, it's like uh, almost like a it's more flexible type of a multi sig. I think the regional multi sig is uh, it's almost yeah. like a very too rigid to to be for practical uses. Mm -hmm. so I think that's probably one of the reasons um, it's not popular. Mm. Correct. And it can also go further than that, because what we can now do is we can take an address and other functions. So where we're talking about hash puzzles of solving um, calculations, of increasing data, of um, doing matrix operations, then all of that can be combined. So people will argue a hash calculation isn't secure because, uh, okay. for instance, big bad miners will take it, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, someone else will take it and send it. Well, you can add the equivalent of an R puzzle calculation, mm -hmm. a uh, require certain keys to be put in there, um, allow masking, all sorts of other things, and then have the computation. For instance, have one of 20 keys, could be any of these keys, and after you put those keys in, then supply the other information with different outputs, depending on what you, uh, you, you put. Now, each of these outputs can have separate address functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, so, the, all, the, even one transaction have multiple outputs, usually they are completely independent. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do them, mm -hmm. each one yeah. can be different from the other. Mm -hmm. Yep. So effectively at the same time, we can also collate different amounts. Um, what do you mean instance, by this? The different outputs uh, contain different uh, Satoshi amounts? Or what? That in part, but we can also add up um, A, B, C, D in, in outputs depending on what is discovered first. If um, someone does this path, then that will get them this sum of outputs. Mm -hmm. The yeah, others, so, yeah, sorry. Right, so, yeah, one example I could think of, uh, we talked about uh, trans traveling salesman a long time ago. So mm -hmm. for one that example I would think of is uh, if they optimize it to a certain, to less than, I don't know, 100 mm -hmm. units, they get uh, yep. this many payout. If it is mm -hmm. even less than 50, they get more double, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yep. Just, uh, okay. All right, so, um, what I'd like you to do before next time then is have okay. a look at both of these functions. So look at uh, mm -hmm. of predicate logic, um, okay. look at uh, some things like uh, uh, tree generation, look mm -hmm. at uh, which is uh, sort of proofs of um, uh, how all this works. If you look at the site I've shown you, uh, it will mm -hmm. give you uh, very complex tree structures just from okay. simple things. It's actually quite good. If you look mm -hmm. at this mm -hmm. click on there, what you'll see okay. is it will take and expand out the, oh, the okay. function. Mm -hmm. So um, that simple function there is actually a lot more complex than it would seem. Mm. It actually, and you can very quickly get um, a lot of potential outputs with some very simple mappings um, allowing us to actually create, I mean, if you think about it, this now creates a very, very simple address function. Uh, not quite sure why I'd actually want to do this particular one, mm -hmm. but um, I could make it more complex with more values than P, Q and R. Uh, I could add and mask other values to allow people to uh, do other calculations. And from there, um, all of these potential outputs, whether they're valid or invalid, will uh, 
well, work and calculate uh, different parts, different keys, different like two of three, three of three, uh, 14 of, of 65, all mm -hmm. sorts of weird and funky things that we may think of. Now, the computation of all of these inputs is going to be the difficult part. Okay. So someone still has to do all of these uh, input calculations beforehand in order to create a script that will do this. But once they've got it, it becomes simple. You mean do it beforehand? You mean code it up or what, what do you mean? Um, code it up, create it as okay. a transaction type. Oh, okay. Okay. I think uh, hopefully with uh, some high level, high level languages like S script is um, at least the, the mm. barrier to entry is yeah. much lower. You don't mm -hmm. have to write uh, like assembly, like a uh, force language, mm. force code anymore. Yeah. So if we could get something that does the equivalent of a, uh, like the tree proof generator here um, and simplifies putting these sort of functions in, then there are other applications that will even take this to a higher level and allow us to take something similar to language and convert it into um, a predicate logic. And the predicate logic can then be taken into um, something that goes into a transaction. Now, that will allow us to define things if we wanted to build, uh, for instance, a sort of operational script. If we think of a contract, um, ideally a contract should be like um, a predicate, but they rarely are because no one ever defines them properly. Um, and you would still have to put in um, side events like if no one agrees, this mediator can sign off, mm -hmm. etc. But um, P can be person um, like Peter. Mm -hmm. Q can be Bob. R could be Robert. And now what we have is if Bob and Robert together agree, and then Peter agrees, okay. um, then if the next stage also happens, the transaction is valid. Whereas if Peter agrees, but, um, but Robert doesn't, then something else happens. Mm -hmm. So we can start doing all sorts of outputs. Now, one thing to think of here is um, if we're using this as a token, it doesn't need to be value the same way as everyone keeps thinking. It can be a marker in a system. If the transaction goes to marker one, this is the event that's happened. If it happens to marker two, this is a different event. Okay. Also, you can have cumulative levels. So remember, uh, I, I mentioned perceptrons before. Mm -hmm. Now we could have a number of Satoshis that act as our inputs. We collect okay. them up. Uh, if I get this number, mm -hmm. um, uh, I've, I've got a, rec uh, a record of that happening. Okay. <clears throat> we don't need to have uh, any of this just automatically occur, like everyone seems to think. We could have it from a wallet that is very specialized. That wallet can only receive from its own transaction sources. Hmm. Um, it can be distributed by a separate level of proof of work from a different group who verifies things. It can be centralized with a single key that gets signed off. It can be like the US Federal Reserve with a number of uh, voting entities. Uh, any way you want to construct it. Yeah, it's a, it's a once a, if they ever tokenize some uh, kind of a US dollar or some other fiat, you can. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, yeah, they can still control the money supply, right? If they, you can code the rules saying, I don't know, uh, five out of six branches have to all sign to to inflate to print out some more money. <laughs> just, just one example oh. I can think of. Yeah, I mean, they don't even do that anymore. That's where people go wrong. It's not, um, 
the the thing they do is issue bonds. So it's loans, uh, in effect, that will get paid back later. Um, so that doesn't even require cash. Mm. That, that's the yeah. irony. Everyone seems to think it's all about cash. It's not. Mm. Uh, and nothing stops government from doing that at any time. You can sit there going, oh, we'll use Bitcoin for everything. We won't. There's not enough BTC, BCH, BSV, mm. Bitcoin Diamond, and whatever else all Doge together to be able yeah. to... Not even that. So uh, the amount of transactional volume per day uh, in the full money supply M3 is in the hundreds of trillions of dollars internationally. So mm. there's not that so, much Bitcoin to exchange. Okay. Well, not even like a, you, you kind of like a build kind of a, some kind of like a token system. Like let's say you have one Satoshi, right? You break it up mm. by, I don't know, one Oh, one you can settle using it. So you oh, can okay. settle using Bitcoin um, and you can put the information in Bitcoin. But that's a different thing to saying that Bitcoin equals uh, the underlying money supply. Okay. Bitcoin can be the foundation, the, the methodology for recording it all. Okay. So uh, I think for me, uh, because I'm uh, mostly from tech background, not from a uh, financial mm -hmm. or monetary background. Yep. So mm -hmm. I was uh, confused with this term. Maybe it's uh, like a, for you, no brainer. So what, what is the difference uh, between money and uh, let's say currency or mm -hmm. cash, sorry, money and cash? Um, uh, so cash would be hard money in Chinese terms, notes and coins. Okay. Um, um, so if we're looking at uh, a combination of physical notes or uh, coinage, that's cash. Okay. The, uh, um, these are the only type of cash? So... Yeah. If it's in a bank, it's not cash. Okay. Uh, if you're using a debit card, you're not using cash. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's... when when banks send from each other, uh, like if you use a mm -hmm. debit card, um, it's only when it goes to a different bank that they even change the settlement. Mm. So if I'm paying you on my debit card, and you're on uh, Lloyd's Bank, and I'm on Lloyd's Bank, then all Lloyd's do is update their internal register. And yeah, it's there's like no a, movement. Yeah, it's a, like an internal ledger. It's the same with a exchange. Like a, if you exactly. just want to well on the same exchange, I send you some coins, there's no movement at all. Exactly. Okay. Um, conversely, if I send uh, to a different bank, that doesn't even, uh, so I'm on Lloyd's and you're in NatWest, uh, I send to you, then that is just at the end of the day or whenever they decide okay. to they settle, settle. I see. they settle the block. So if there's been a thousand transactions today, we settle up how, many, how much I've sent to you, how much they've sent back to me, and just pay the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, you don't, you don't, yeah. You don't yeah. have to send everything. It's just a, it's a, like a sum by the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so every now and again, there'll be exchanges of money or whatever else, but generally that doesn't even happen. Um, the amounts held by the banks on the reserve bank or whatever else will update. Mm-hmm. So rather than moving cash, I will say to you, um, all right, uh, our netting, we've paid a million dollars um, this way and a million one hundred this way. Uh, mm -hmm. So you owe me one hundred dollars. The Reserve Bank will change their netting to a hundred dollars. Okay. So yeah, I tried to. Are, uh -huh. sorry. Just one, right? In, in total, mm -hmm. just one. Yeah. So the only real change will be when people physically take money out of the bank. Mm -hmm. If they take it as cash, then the bank has to uh, sort of account for the cash that has moved and um, then update their cash reserves, etc. Okay, then a follow up question would be then uh, why, why just name uh, Bitcoin peer to peer cash instead of let's say Currency or money or is it a legal uh, well, term? It's, or it's, it... Well, no, it's not like currency. 
it's like cash. So it's a digital token. So the okay, idea so almost is like a, almost like a physical coin. It's just a, yeah. it's electronic. So that's why it's mm -hmm. got that. Yep. Okay. So um, rather than being an account based system like Ethereum is trying to be, it is a commodity amount that is minted into individual coins. So each token uh, would be the equivalent, imagine a pile of, of grains of mm -hmm. gold. And you put a certain number of grains of gold together and you make a coin of that value. And Bitcoin has an incredibly accurate scale. Okay, so we Satoshi? Can tell, mm -hmm, yeah, we can tell right down to the Satoshi what you've got. Uh, but like gold, there's no such thing as a half grain. There's mm -hmm. a grain of gold and that, that's as small as they, they go. I mean, scales could probably get more accurate now, but when they did all mm -hmm. this, they couldn't. Uh, and a grain isn't terribly much anyway. I'm not actually mm -hmm. sure in grams what a grain weighs. I might actually check that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you imagine it's very yeah. small? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's about one gram. It's oh, one okay. <laughs> 5760th of a troy pound. Uh, sorry, SI units. Uh, so now I'm wrong. It's 64.8. Seven nine eight nine one milligrams. Wow. Okay. So uh, not very much at all. Mm. So one troy grain is uh, sixty four point eight approximately milligrams. Mm. So just um, uh, I, mm? trying to play a devil's advocate here is uh, how is this? Mm -hmm. you, you just talk about I think is uh, not everything has not all the transactions has to end up mm -hmm. on chain. A lot of time it's just a, it's almost mm -hmm. like a settlement layer. Mm -hmm. So how is this a narrative different from, uh, I think a lot of, uh, especially the BTC people that are claiming, oh, you don't, why, if you're buying a coffee, why does it have to end on chain? It's just uh, going to be, you know, uh, to be the settlement layer, Bitcoin is to be different reserve banks between different nations. How, how, how are these two narratives? I, I think they're different, right? No, uh, very different. Um... I mean, they just come up. Um, at the end of the day, um, every bit of your cash will end up there. So uh, Bitcoin's designed to be a micropayment system, first and foremost. It's not designed to be a cash settlement system for banks or anything like this. There are already plenty of those. The argument is, oh, we can move many millions of dollars. But as soon as you do that, you're going to have to put AML in. Bitcoin works when you're talking small amounts. So there are no money reporting uh, requirements for $200 purchases. Mm -hmm. There are when you get to $5,000 purchases. I see. Okay. Um, so in theory, people sit there going, you don't need to do X, Y, Z. Well, actually you do. Um, I keep arguing this. It's not money handling rules. Don't say money. They say funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, washes, you know, mm. gold, I don't know. Yep. And that was the old Arthur Badowski Liberty Reserve one. It says funding. They don't care what it is. It's just funding. So if you are doing a funding transaction, you have to put all the AML into play. Mm. Now, that means, like it or not, exchanges are going to have to comply. Wallets are going to have to comply, et cetera. But if we're building, I mean, which is banks can do that now. That's not an issue. And banking the unbanked isn't about um, people who um, can't move a, a, a million dollars. Yeah. The people in Africa who are unbanked aren't worried about not being able to move $20 million. No. They're worried about not mm -hmm. being able to move $5. Yeah. America. But, uh... Yeah, if you're less than $2, unfortunately, the mm. block streams think uh, you're not supposed to use Bitcoin anyway. Yeah. I know. So the middleman um, is going to exist for those large transactions. Mm -hmm. um, the feds in America have already started cracking down and all this, we don't need it. Well, that's complete BS. Um, there's going to be AML built into Bitcoin. As, as I've said, the identity part of Bitcoin may be firewalled off, 
but it's still there. So uh, that can probably be uh, the next part as well. Uh, before everyone gets back, I'll chase Briggy up as well and get her to send mm -hmm. some things while we're waiting on Arm to uh, finish holidays. I don't know, these people okay. take time off. Um, yeah. But we'll also look at um, uh, maybe building some external systems that allow mm -hmm. people to deterministically link keys. Hmm. Is, uh, is um, this like a hierarchical deterministic scheme or? Is Similar, but uh, what we want to do is do things like um, transaction order so that we can provably say, say invoice number, customer key, invoice number. And we can have a function where we go uh, invoice one, invoice two, invoice three, invoice four, and provably show that everything is there in order and that nothing's missing. Okay. Yeah, one thing I could imagine is uh, you can use some kind of like a chain of hash, you mm, know, so correct. Mm -hmm. it cannot be broken. Mm. So I think a related question is, uh, since now you're talking about a little bit uh, external system, because uh, we mm -hmm. are, well, the theme of this talk is about the virtual machine and virtual mm -hmm. machine, I, as far as I can tell, there are two, two kinds of virtual machine. Why is that like a, the Bitcoin or some other blockchain uh, virtual machines we, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that uh, mm -hmm. they can, they are like, um, Pure function it is a sandbox. Mm -hmm. You cannot mm -hmm. uh, know outside external event. Like uh, you cannot do yep. read file or send a network request versus some other like a Java. Right? They have a virtual machine, but they can also do, they can have access to external environment. So is this uh, mm. by design? And uh, so if you want to access external information, you have to introduce Oracle or is this true? Um, well, you can create like um, weather, scripts. weather data, yeah. Yeah, you can create scripts that becomes more complex. Um, so uh, how do you trust weather data? Yeah, you, some Oracle or some Oracles have to sign. Is this the only way I can yeah. think of? Yeah, I mean, this is the problem. Everyone sits there, why can't we automate this? But what do you automate? Mm, I think it's just uh, the way I can think of is uh, you can auto automate the, the different the financial transactions, right? For example, you have some kind of like a uh, futures depending on the weather. Mm -hmm. the, the next season is good or not. You can you can settle. But where the, do you get the weather? Oh, some uh, you have to trust some uh, third parties in this way. Yeah. So um, third parties can give signed information. They can do uh, something the equivalent of uh, keys based on different output values. Um, all sorts of funky things. They could, you could have um, multiple uh, sort of values waiting. Don't think about it as a single transaction. Think mm -hmm. that if we have a billion different transactions and we have an input transaction from a weather service that will be signed. Mm -hmm. And depending on what it signs, then the difference will be what then becomes valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, like, it uh, can sign one, um, which will then sign one of these transactions. So that's why I'm saying parallel. Mm -hmm. So have temperature zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and have a separate transaction for each of those different outcomes and store mm -hmm. them all. Mm -hmm. Only one of them becomes valid on chain. Yes, I think I now I'm uh, after I did do some examples of the the transaction mm -hmm. graph. I think I've become mm -hmm. more and more, you know, get to know this this um, mm. uh, this way of thinking. You, because yeah. otherwise, you have so, to code all the if else. Maybe you have mm. 100 uh, degrees from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. You have to put all this in the Bitcoin transaction. Mm. That's not ideal versus what you just mentioned. You just yeah. pre-create all this 100 mm -hmm. separate ones. And so someone thing... will argue that it's memory or storage um, complexity is large, but storage and memory are cheap. Yeah. Storage versus, is getting cheaper. Yeah. And especially if you start on off-chain, I think mm. it's, 
especially as it is now, uh, even for the exactly. first yeah, feature, so you store it's all this off chain. Um, and people then make the argument, I've had this one before, what if you lose all these transactions? Same, same with your keys. Um, but yeah, what if I lose my keys? You lose. <laughs> So oh, you, you still have the same, yeah. So you still have the same issues, the same everything else. So you can't make the argument, "What if I lose?" When you're talking about, "What if I lose um, a file?" A file is a file is a file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it I mean, doesn't matter. It's uh, one kilobyte or one megabyte. I think if you exactly, lose it. exactly. All right. Um, so we probably should finish up there okay. for the day. Um, so. Your homework is to start learning okay. some predicate logic. Predicate. Okay. Um, uh, if you don't find any sites or anything like this, hit me up on it. I think um, uh, I will start with uh, the ones you just sent here. Um, I could probably I get can... you some other ones too. Send me a reminder okay. and I'll get you some files on it. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of uh, uh, I've got a lot of um, uh, notes from university courses in the past and okay. things like this. So. Um, <laughs> That's good. Uh, so we can go from there. Um, and then what we'll look at is um, extending our, our inputs, uh, building external identity, and also um, how we then parallelize code. Okay. Yeah. That's so we're a lot going of to start. Uh, yeah. So, like where come. you're saying about oracles, what we want to do, start doing is thinking about how we then have all of these like the the arguments i had with the bch people was all we need to put this on chain we don't need to put it all on chain we don't mm -hmm. want to put it all on chain we don't want to have the weather value sitting on chain what we want to do is have it all off chain until something happens and then send it that was always the difference between where my version of things with n lock time for instance Mm -hmm. And lock time versus CLTV. CLTV, they stick it on chain and go, mm -hmm. we're going to wait. Uh, then we can't lose the transaction. But you can mm -hmm. lose the keys. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the irony. I could never get them to understand this. They're sitting there going, yeah. but you can't lose the transaction now. But you can lose the damn keys, which is a file. If you lose the file, you lose the file. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway. It's, uh... <sighs> yeah. Good luck so, uh, convincing them. <laughs> Cannot I just know, spend too I've much given time. up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so we're just going to do it and not worry. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, this thing has two terabytes worth of storage. Yeah, you uh, can store some I mean, uh, keys. <laughs> it's ridiculous, and they're getting larger. I mean, I used to fill my phone up all the time. Now I, I fill up maybe twenty percent of them. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, Unless uh, you're you are taking. About, Selfies all day, yeah. Even then, two terabytes is a lot of storage. Okay. Um, and then you add the fact that most of the stuff is stored off the phone um, with cloud storage. Mm -hmm. There's only two terabyte that you access regularly. So I've got 20 terabyte worth of cloud storage as okay. well. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's ridiculous if you think about it. How, I mean, 20 years ago, Terabytes were considered huge. Now they're not. Yeah, it's like uh, when you send, make the comments. Yeah, in ten years time, you may people may watch uh, HD videos online. So yeah. I mm -hmm. think it's uh, now everybody take it for granted. So correct. All right. So okay. um, as I said, send me those those links. I'll, I'm going to chase up um, um, Owen and okay. see if I can give him a kick in the bum about taking some time <laughs> okay. off. Okay. Yeah. Take a break. Yeah. So. <laughs> Special and, time. Uh, okay. Uh, but um, as I said, we want to split these into having transactions externally. Um, mm -hmm. There are ways of doing that so that we can save it. Uh, what we'll talk about with a different version of deterministic keys will also allow us to store those in a simpler manner because if we have a calculable address, uh, which we can do, then that's going to allow us to recreate some of these things much simpler. Okay. Yeah. Seems okay. a lot uh, to cover. So yeah. We need to look forward so to that. A okay. little bit by little bit. Um, okay. But as I said, um, I want you to start looking at um, uh, propositional logic because okay. um, once you understand that, that's where we can start doing circuits. Hmm.
and circuits can actually be very large and very complex. Um, there are some. Uh, I mean, this is how some some of the things like um, uh, the F111. Uh, mm -hmm. It was incredibly efficient because many of the functions were just hardwired. Hmm. Okay. And we can do wow. the same in Bitcoin. Wow! So <laughs> exciting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Take care. Thank you. You too. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye.